Thank you. So at this point, we'll welcome Linda Welch to the stage, to the floor, podium. And I'm excited to be here in the same conference that Alan Hutchinson spoke at, because Alan gave me my first job in wildlife 25 years ago when we were both young children, Alan. <laughs> it's hard to believe that was 25 years ago as an undergrad that Alan hired me to work for him at the Endangered Species Program. So I'm really excited to talk to you about seabirds today. This is going to be a little bit different than some of the talks we've heard earlier in the day that are focused on land conservation efforts. I'm going to ask you to step offshore with me and, um, and look at some of the trends that we're seeing in the seabirds that are breeding along the coast of Maine. And while seabirds have been used as indicators of ecosystem change around the world, it's somewhat of a new concept for us here in the Gulf of Maine. And I pulled this information together last spring for a conference, and I was hoping that I would at least have one interesting example to show how they could be valuable indicators of ecosystem change, because we know that the Gulf of Maine has undergone some pretty drastic changes in recent years. Just to provide a little bit of perspective, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and our conservation partners have been working for the past 30 years to manage tern, puffin, and razorbill colonies along the coast of Maine. That means we put seasonal technicians out on the islands. Those technicians control predators, manage habitat, and monitor the seabird colonies. That means we have long-term data sets on colony size, reproductive rates, feeding rates, diet composition, survival and recruitment rates. That's not a very common thing to have a you know, a 30-year data set for multiple study sites. Um, our sites go all the way from um, eastern Maine, where we have Eastern Brothers Island, all the way down to Stratton Island, but we also partner with folks on Machias Seal Island working with Canadian Wildlife Service and University of New Brunswick, and biologists uh, working on um, Seavey Island out on the Isle of Shoals. And for the majority of the talk, I'm going to divide the Gulf of Maine into what I'm going to call Eastern Gulf of Maine to the right of the red line and Western Gulf of Maine. And I kind of arbitrarily drew that line, but the basis for my decision was both biological and physical. Um, all of the razorbills, the majority of the Atlantic puffin, and the majority of the Arctic terns in the Gulf of Maine in the United States breed to the right of that red line. And we have a few puffins and a few arctic terns breeding to the left, but um, the majority of the birds, again, are breeding on the right-hand side. And we also have some of the major currents in the Gulf of Maine following a similar pattern. And so we have cold water coming down on the Labrador current, coming into the Gulf of Maine th with this eastern Maine coastal current. And then it gets somewhere around Penobscot Bay. Most of that cold, really productive water gets deflected out into the Gulf of Maine again. So it seemed like a logical um, dividing point for me to compare colonies in east and west. And so I talked about the Labrador currents. That water tends to be cold um, and somewhat nutrient poor water coming from the north. And then the other major current coming into the Gulf of Maine is the Gulf Stream, which tends to be warmer, saltier, and have a higher nutrient content. We've seen similar maps today about um, climate change and how things are warming. But this chart represents the average annual sea surface temperature in the Gulf of Maine. And basically, the Gulf of Maine has been warming for decades, shown by this um, black line here. But what I want you to focus in on is since 2004, that rate of warming has increased substantially. Um, and 2012 was the warmest year on record. And I was at a conference in Boston on Tuesday, and they said 2014 is going to be right up there with it. Um, so. It's a very new situation. Things are warming very quickly. This is a different way of looking at that data set. Um, again, it's the Gulf of Maine. White represents average temperatures. And this is for the month of July in 2002 over here. So light blue means it's a little bit cooler on average. This was 2012, where you see red represents much warmer than average. So it wasn't a small scale issue. It was a large issue throughout the entire Gulf of Maine. And I also realized at this conference earlier in the week that they now believe that the Gulf of Maine is warming, than, warming faster than 99% of the other ocean water bodies. Um, it's phenomenal. I didn't realize that the situation that we're experiencing is so much worse than other places on the globe. What else do we know about the Gulf of Maine? Recently, a group of researchers 
sat down and looked at a bunch of information, and they basically determined that the Gulf of Maine underwent what they're calling a regime shift in about 2004, again, the year that that um, rapid increase in warming started to occur in the Gulf of Maine. And this basically is a significant change in how the water patterns are circulating within the Gulf of Maine in the nutrient flow. We've seen a significant decline in the influx of nutrient-rich slope water. It's changed the mass, the heat, the salinity, and the nutrient budgets of all kinds of organisms in the Gulf. They're not really sure what drove this regime shift. It could be related to the North Atlantic Oscillation, but they don't really know because it doesn't seem to be lining up entirely. Um, but we've seen an increased influx of fresh water, a decrease in nutrients, and a decrease in salinity. And basically, that's messing up phytoplankton and zooplankton. When they bloom, what species are there, when those, um, how strong those blooms are, and they're the basis of the entire marine food web. So when you alter primary productivity, everything working up the food chain is going to be affected. A couple of things to remember about seabirds in the marine system. Seabirds are central place foragers, which means they breed on these offshore islands, but then they have to fly somewhere to find food and come back to feed their chicks. If the food isn't at the right depth in the water column or within commuting distances, they can't use it. So there could be millions of fish out there, but if they're 100 miles away from a seabird colony, it's not accessible to those birds. One of the challenges that we face is that the marine ecosystem is so dynamic. What's great foraging habitat today or next week might not be used again for 10 years. The fish are moving around. The abundance and distribution of the fish are influenced by a lot of factors, everything from sea surface temperature, bottom topography, salinity, primary productivity, the currents, weather patterns, water depth, and it gets really complicated to try to figure this out. And again, seabirds have to return back to that breeding colony in order to feed the chicks. In a situation, I have um, Machias Seal Island. Those birds, for years, were having difficulty feeding their chicks. And in 2005, what was the largest tern colony in the Gulf of Maine, 3,500 pairs abandoned. And up until 2014, had not produced a single chick. And so when you just basically remove a huge cohort of Arctic and common terns from the Gulf of Maine, it's having significant effects. One of the most important prey items for seabirds in the Gulf of Maine, we know from our monitoring efforts, are Atlantic herring. And a lot of the fisheries people I talk to believe that herring are in trouble and not nearly as abundant as they used to be. But when you talk to folks at DMR and NOAA, their stock assessments say everything's good. Um, and the NOAA assessment that I read um, sorry, last spring, even went as far to say that overharvesting was completely impossible. And just given our past history of fisheries management, I find it somewhat insane to think that we could say that. Um, and their assessment that the stock was great was based on looking at the last 10 years, one year of really good recruitment, which to me doesn't seem that to make a lot of sense. Um, I don't think having one year of good data means a population is entirely stable. But it's hard to get a good handle on Atlantic herring because our estimates are based on harvest rates, and those are influenced by gear type and quotas and economic factors just as much as, as fish resources and their availability. And so I put up this um, diagram, which a colleague of mine, which the best part is the simplified food web part, um, that Bill Monavecki at um, the, up in Newfoundland came up with. And so this is his representation of the food web in the Northwest Atlantic. And so it's completely insane. It's crazy. But this little box represents herring. And so I put it up here because if you're really trying to understand what's driving herring, availability and abundance, good luck to you trying to figure out all this. So what we've been saying, this red circle up here, represents seabirds. And some of the things that we've been saying are, well, it's pretty obvious, you can see seabirds. They're above the water. They're located throughout the region. There's various trophic levels that re they represent, and there's various species. And so um, clearly, they, make a good, they should make good indicators of what's going on. They also form these large breeding colonies where we can actually go out and monitor these things. The fisheries biologists are sometimes shocked at some of the data that we're collecting at the colonies because they say, we just don't know what's going on below, below the water surface, but you guys are seeing it right on the breeding colonies. And then this group over here is just based on whatever species you elect to study, 
you can study surface feeders, or you could study birds that are capable of diving over 100 meters. You can get birds that feed near shore versus offshore. So you have a lot of variability in what matrix you're looking at. And you can also vary the time scale that you're concerned about. If you just look at how well do your chicks grow, it might be a four to eight week window in the summer. If you look at overall reproductive rates, it could be several months, you know, May to August. Population level effects could be the result of changes over years or decades. A lot of these seabirds live into their 30s, and so um, it might take a long time to start seeing subtle changes show up in population level effects. And it's also important to remember that adult seabirds, they're adapted to living in a highly dynamic system. They're used to dealing with variable prey levels, and so they have options like eating a different prey type, um, altering their time budget, meaning you're going to try harder, you have less downtime, you're working harder to find that food for your chicks. You might not breed at all, or you could move to a new colony. And so they should have a lot of ways of dealing with um, declines in forage fish here in the Gulf of Maine that clearly aren't working for them. And so the first parameter I wanted to look at was clutch size, the number of eggs on average being laid by the various species. And I made the assumption that there shouldn't be a big difference in migration or wintering conditions or habitats based on which island you nest on in Maine. They winter off the coast of Brazil and Argentina, common in roseate terns. Arctic terns go all the way down to the Antarctic region. Um, but, so I made the assumption that changes in clutch size should be the result of varying habit con habitat conditions once you arrive back on the breeding grounds. And one of the things that surprised me is when I first started at the refuge 16 years ago, the terns, Petit Manan Island, if you go out the door and look to the right, you can see Petit Manan Island, which is one of the colonies I'm going to talk about. Um, those birds would show up around May 16th, 17th, every year, very consistent. In recent years, they're there about May 5th or 6th. Um, and the first year it happened, we thought, oh, that was kind of an anomaly. Something must have triggered them to move earlier, migrate earlier but it's now been probably the last five or six years. They're showing up earlier, but they're not laying their eggs any earlier, so they're spending more time in the area surrounding their breeding colony before they lay their eggs, which I think is having a greater influence on their clutch size. And again, I didn't really think I would see a difference in clutch size, but um, surprisingly enough, I did. So the red symbols are from islands in the western Gulf of Maine, three different colonies, showing a slightly increasing trend in clutch size. They're laying more eggs than they used to. The green line is representative of Petit Manan colony, um, showing a significantly decreasing trend over that time period. Birds in the eastern Gulf of Maine are laying, common terns are laying fewer eggs. Arctic terns only lay one to two eggs. So again, less variability, but I saw the same pattern. Birds in eastern Gulf of Maine shown by the green and red lines are decreasing. This black line is um, a very small colony of Arctic terns in the western, on the left-hand side of my red line, um, Eastern Egg Rock. And so that's the only colony that seems to be holding its own for clutch size. We also know from our monitoring efforts that herring and hake are key prey items brought back to the tern chicks. We know how often they're fed, what species are fed each year. Unfortunately, in recent years, we're seeing things like this. This chick on the left is trying to swallow a butterfish, which is like the size of a half dollar. It's simply too large for the chick to swallow. And our crews watch as thousands of chicks slowly starve to death, surrounded by carcasses of butterfish that their desperate parents are bringing in and trying to feed them. We're also seeing an increased frequency of turns bringing back things like moths. So when you look at the nutri nutritional quality of a moth fed to your chick versus bill loads of herring or hake, is going to have some drastic effects on your chicks. This chart represents um, dietary items fed to Arctic tern chicks on Petit Manan. And so the blue represents herring, red hake, green are invertebrates, and purple are butterfish, again, the fish that are too, too big to swallow. And a couple of things here. Prior to 2004, herring and hake made up about 80% of the diet fed to Arctic tern chicks on Petit Manan. After 2004, Hake disappears, and the diet becomes much more variable. In this second circle over here, we're kind of two years of worst case scenario, where the terns were feeding 40 to 50% either invertebrates or butterfish to their chicks. And we saw drastically reduced productivity rates 
Our goal is to have one chick produced per pair for turns, and we saw productivity rates 60 to 70 percent lower than our target. And so simply the adult birds couldn't find suitable fish to feed their chicks. When I expanded that analysis to look at Petit Manan seal and Matinicus rock, so is it just a Petit Manan issue or is it larger than that? Um, hake seem to be available, have been available to Matinicus rock and seal throughout the time period. So they had a little bit of a buffer, but 2010 and 2011 were bad across the board and turn productivity was absolutely horrible. So how does this change in, in diet items influence chick growth rates? I wanted to see, are the chicks growing at the same rate? Has it influenced that? In order to do so, I looked at what's called linear growth rates, the average rate of gain, weight gain from day five to 15. Um, and this is only for surviving chicks. So if you starve to death, I didn't include that data in the data set. The black line represents Machaya Seal Island. Remember the colony that completely abandoned because they couldn't find enough food um, and there were some predation issues. This is Matinicus Rock. Um, it appears to be a fairly similar trend line. And so you start wondering what's going on there. Um, again, that's for Arctic terns. So we're seeing chicks on average are growing at a much slower rate, putting on less weight. This is for common terns. And so I was able to compare colonies in the eastern Gulf of Maine versus western Gulf of Maine. Again, Machaya Seal Island, you're seeing declining growth rates in the chicks before the colony abandoned. Um, the trend line isn't as bad for Matinicus Rock, but it's still declining. And this pink line up here represents Pond Island at the mouth of the Kennebec. And I highlight that because on average, those chicks are gaining three to four grams a day more than turns in the eastern Gulf of Maine. And so if you only weigh 110, 120 grams, having a 20% difference in your weight when you now need to fly to Argentina could make a big difference in your survival for those juvenile birds. Moving on to annual productivity rates, number of chicks produced per pair. So again, prior to 2004, um, which is this red line, the black line represents our target of one chick per pair. You see annual variability, but the productivity was um, a little over one for Arctic terns on those three colonies in the eastern Gulf of Maine. After 2004, when the regime shift happened, productivity drops to 0.6 chicks per pair. Again, that's a significant decrease. Same thing when we look at common terns. Prior to um, the regime shift in 04, you have over 1.1 chicks per pair, and you're dropping about 30% um, to 0.73 after that fact. Again, a significant decrease. I wanted to know if, is it just an eastern Maine thing? Are birds outside of this part of the Gulf of Maine having similar issues? So the red line represents the three colonies in the eastern Gulf of Maine, all showing declining productivity and the black line represents six colonies in the western Gulf of Maine. So there really is a difference. It's something happening right off the shore here that's uniquely different than what's happening on colonies in the southern Gulf of Maine. So um, I mentioned that we've been working on turn recovery for 30 years, and for a large part of my time working at the refuge, I stood up and talked about what a great job we were doing with turn recovery. Um, I can't do that anymore. At first I thought we're having a couple of bad years, but it's well beyond that now. Um, common tern, our most abundant species, is holding somewhat stable, um, but the number, we've decreased by 4%, but the number of colonies is down about a third. Arctic terns, which are state-threatened species, have declined by 57% in the last 10 years. And this represents all of the Arctic terns breeding in the lower 48 states. Um, the number of colonies is down 50%. Roseate tern, federally endangered, down about a third, and we're also losing colonies. Although there's a lot of literature saying that terns should be good indicators of marine change, marine ecosystem change, there's just as many articles saying you shouldn't bother looking at puffins. They only lay one egg, they raise one chick, and they spend a lot of time standing around, loafing on a colony. So if things are bad, you basically just ramp up your effort, try a little harder, you can still find, find food for your chick, no problem. But in recent years, we're starting to see, instead of bill loads of sand lance and herring and hake, these are euphosid shrimp. Again, the nutritional quality of feeding an invertebrate versus a lipid-rich fish are pretty obvious. On Machaya Steel Island, they're able to weigh the chicks when they fledge from their burrows, um, and we're seeing declining average fledging rates at that colony. And these were um, the number of chicks produced 
per year at um, each of the colonies. And you can see this is 2012 and 2013, um, less than 0.2 chicks on all of the colonies, really bad. This year, thankfully, things seem to be much better. Food, food resources seem a lot better, and so those colonies have rebounded. We're working really hard to try to figure out where the heck these seabirds are going to find food and the habitat characteristics. So we've been putting satellite tags on razor bills and also great shearwaters to study much further offshore. And we've been using coded radio tags on a number of turns, over 100 turns, on a number of colonies. And we have 7 million records where we can study um, how long they're gone, which direction they fly, how often they feed their chicks. And this is part of a much larger network. Um, there's a tower here on this campus. We have people tagging songbirds, shorebirds, bats. Um, shorebirds in the Arctic are showing up on some of our towers. So it's this really large collaborative effort that's going to teach us huge amounts about migration. And again, we're learning some really interesting things. Like Arctic terns are already spending 14 hours a day foraging. They can't try any harder, basically. And they could be flying up to 80 kilometers per trip. They're working really hard. It's not just a matter of spend a little bit more time and you can find food for your chicks. So Arctic terns are in serious trouble. Um, we're seeing declining growth rates and productivity rates. There's a global population decline. And there's actually interest, I think, within the US to potentially list them under the Endangered Species Act. And from our tagging efforts, we know these birds are traveling 89,000 kilometers per year. They fly across the Atlantic, down the coast of Africa, to South America, to Antarctic, and they're flying back and, around, back and forth before coming back to Maine. And again, they live um, into their mid-30s. So during their lifetime, it's the equivalent, I think, of two and a half round trips to the moon that they're flying. They need really good, reliable food throughout that migration. For the Gulf of Maine, we know the sea surface temperature is increasing. Um, there appears to be decreased availability of herring to a lot of species of seabirds. We know this regime shift occurred in 2004, and it's clearly reflected in our seabird populations. Again, I was hoping to have like one little example of, look, the seabirds showed that, that change and every parameter I looked at showed significant decreases. And if you're not depressed enough, um, we've done some recent population assessments on blackback herring gulls and double-crested cormorants, and all three of those species have declined significantly in recent years. Blackback gulls are down, um, in the last 15 years, 50%, herring gulls 22%, cormorants 47%. We tend to think of gulls as generalists, and so I feel like if they can't get it together, um, what can? And certainly not all of this is food driven. There are some predation issues with eagles on, on gulls and it's a complicated situation, but I think food probably is driving some of this. Common eiders feed primarily on blue mussels and we're seeing large scale declines in not only breeding eiders, but molting eiders coming down from Canada, potentially up to a third. Um, so to try to end on a good note, um, we've been trying to advocate that we need to do a better job at integrating the data that we're collecting. Because seabird people talk to seabird people, ma marine mammal people talk to marine mammal, fisheries people talk to fisheries people. And we've been saying we all need to get together and work on this issue. And um, last year we were able to compete for a multi-state state wildlife grant for a half million dollars um, for this Gulf of Maine Coastal Ecosystem Survey where they're running transects collecting um, a whole suite of information on seabirds, marine mammals, herring acoustic surveys, phytoplankton, zooplankton, salinity, temperature, everything, um, trying to understand why species are where they are, what habitat characteristics are linked with that, and how that's likely to change in the future. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Linda. A few minutes for questions, we've got one. That was fascinating, thank you. Um, I'm wondering whether you've been able to track um, alewife predation as well as Atlantic herring predation and whether uh, the pond island slight increase that trajectory there might be related to the removal of the dams in the Kennebec. So the alewife issue is a unique or an interesting situation because one of the things that we've thought about bald eagle predation on some of the seabird colonies is that due to the decline in alewife runs, eagles have shifted their um, foraging effort onto seabird islands. And so it's quite often for us to see 10 to 15 eagles 
raiding gull, cormorant, and eider colonies. And so we're definitely seeing um, a shift in their predation efforts. Um, the Pond Island situation, it's right at the mouth of the Kennebec, which is a really productive bay system or um, river system. And so that seems to be a unique setting where the terns are doing really well. But there's a couple of examples that I could have shown. Like, for, for some of the tern colonies, people will show up at our annual meeting and say, oh, productivity was terrible. We only had 2.2 chicks per pair. And I'm thinking, uh, at Petit Manan, I haven't seen that. And I haven't seen that ever. Um, but I've only seen one chick produce per pair, I think, once in the last seven years. And so southern Maine, those colonies seem to be doing really well. For whatever reason, the food resources seem very good at a whole suite of colonies down there and seem to be very poor in this part of the Gulf of Maine. So I'm not sure I answered that. It's very complex, but I, certainly the alewives factor into the predation issue for some of the colonies. Yeah. Um, it seemed like the, that we're talking about two different sources of water from the ocean, and there was uh, decreased salinity, increased temperature in, from Labrador current. Are we seeing shifts in the Gulf Stream, or is that staying more stable? So one of the things they think that's influencing what's going on in the Gulf of Maine is melting of the Arctic. And so you have that fresh water from the ice melting, and it's nutrient-poor fresh water that's coming down. And it's kind of displacing some of the warmer, nutrient-rich water that should be coming in from the in the Gulf, because some of the models are predicting that we should, um, the Gulf Stream should be having more of an influence than it is. So they're not, they qu don't quite understand how this is all happening, but I think it's influencing the stratification of the water column. So the nutrients might be there, but it's not in a place that's being freely accessed by some of the species. So it gets really, really complicated. Other questions? Everybody's excited for lunch, okay. Well, with that, thank you so much, Linda.